Hello, friends, and welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. My name is Scott Cowan, and I'm the host of the show. Each episode, I have a conversation with an interesting guest who is living in or from Washington State. These are casual conversations with real and interesting people. I think you're going to like the show. So let's jump right in with today's guest. Hi, Krista. How are you doing? Hey there, Scott. <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank you. So why don't you take a couple seconds, minutes, that's fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Give my audience a little bit of background, backstory on you and why why are we talking today? Uh, sure. Um, well, I, I think... I think we're talking today because your show um, <laughs> seeks to uh, introduce people to different parts of Washington state. And uh, I'm on Whidbey Island, which is a really beautiful and interesting part of beautiful Washington state. It is, but you didn't hear me throw, you didn't hear that bus back over here that I just threw you under, did you? <laughs> it just, just threw you under the bus. Okay. Awesome. So you're on Whidbey, but you didn't start on Whidbey. So how, what's your journey? How did you end up on lovely Whidbey Island? So I wound up on lovely Whidbey Island, um, you know, honestly, because of a little uh, visit trip I took with my mother. So I, I'm i originally from New York City. Uh, I moved to Seattle in 1996, and I was living in Seattle, and my mother would come to visit. And we would take advantage of being in this you know, great place and explore more of the Northwest. So we've, you know, we'd go to the Oregon coast or to Victoria or wherever. Mm -hmm. Um, And in, I forget what year it was, but she came out and she's like, let's just do something a little smaller, you know, instead of doing some big trip. And so, you know, we're throwing out ideas and, um, and she said, well, so I was reading in the New York times about this place called Whidbey Island. And I'm like, "Mm, I don't know. I I mean, because I had been there. So I should say that for a number of years, I was a traveling sales rep, like a a, a road sales rep. So I would drive around and stop at a lot of different places. And so I was familiar with um, Oak Harbor, which is the, the city at the north part of the island. Um, there's a naval air station there, um, and Oak Harbor's really nice town, but it it's kind of suburban. There's you know a Walmart and a Home Depot, and my mom lives in New York City. Like you know, if we're gonna do something. We should do something a little different. And I was like, Mom, that's great, but I just I don't think. I don't think Oak Harbor is your speed, you know, I, I'm just, so we toss out other ideas and she comes back to the, she's like, but that article just made that place sound so good. And I'm like, ah, oh, geez, ma, um, you know, there are other islands. We can go here. We can go there. <laughs> we keep circling. And she turns to me. She's like, I'm your mother. Humor me. I'm like, okay. We're going to Whidbey Island. That's okay. But we did things a little differently. We came up through the Olympic Peninsula, took the ferry from Port Townsend, and spent time in central and southern Whidbey. And uh, Whidbey is a very long island. It's um, over 45 miles long. And kind of each community has its own personality. And in all those years of visiting visiting stores and selling things i never made it to the south end but on that trip i did and i something something stuck um i had in all of my travels and again i had been a sales rep in other parts of the com- country as well i had always been attracted to to seaside communities mm-hmm. to small kind of touristy towns, I guess, but by the water and different islands, you know, from from New England to Florida to Europe to even here in the Pacific Northwest. Like I I liked the San Juans like when I first went, but I never felt I never felt that, quite frankly, they would accept me. Mm, okay. 
they'd be like, you know what? You can take your New York ass and go back home. We're never going to let you become part of this community. But somehow on the, the south end of Whidbey, it felt different. And I thought, hmm, I think I, think I might have found my place. And um, I returned um, that winter in November. So this trip with my mother was in August. So of course the weather's gorgeous. Um, I returned in November for like a week, just me and the dog and walking the beaches. And November is the wettest, stormiest, windiest month of the year, at least here on the island. Um, and I still loved it, um, even with that kind of intense weather. And I just said, well, if I love it in November, I think I think this is my spot. And I moved here the following April. Okay, so I have two questions based on that okay. story. All right, number one, yeah. did your mother tell you? I told you. Did your mother? <laughs> did your mother give you a hard time when you said, "Hey, mom, I'm moving to Whidbey"? What did your mom <laughs> say to that? She was like, "Well, okay, that's kind of a jump, but all right." You know, I had already moved across country, and so she was kind of used to me. Okay, just picking up and moving. Okay. Then the other question, which may seem completely not connected, but I will connect it, I promise you. So you grew up in the New York area. So important question, Yankees or Mets? Oh, gosh. You know, honestly, I, I can't do baseball. It's just too slow. See, that's why they accepted you. Yeah. I because just... the thing is, is so, so this is my experience with New Yorkers. Nothing bad here. Mm -hmm. And it, but Yankee fans are fanatical. Mm -hmm. And they wear it outwardly. Yeah. Which can be a little abrasive. Mets fans are a little bit more like they're fans, but they don't wear it outwardly. But yeah. you, you're not a baseball fan, which I don't know why we're talking, but that's okay. <laughs> but the yeah. point is, is that you, you could be welcome. Because if you were, and I can't do a good New York accent. I really wish I could. But, you know, if you were that stereotypical New Yorker, Yankee fan type thing, yeah, you might have had a hard time. But. I can't, I'm really kind of kidding you, but your mom, I, I bet your mom was like, mm -hmm. Told <laughs> yeah, you. okay. Yeah. The I New York right. times was right. Weren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so you, yeah. you moved to Whitby pretty fast. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. So, well, I, I had been in, I had been in uh, Seattle for 12 years at right. that point. So but still, that's still a jump. I don't know if this redeems me or not, but I was a Sonic season ticket holder while I was in Seattle. So you know, I might not be into baseball, but that still hurts. Hearing that word <laughs> still hurts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that, you, yeah. Well, and look, I'm not telling you to be a Mariners fan, by the way, that, that's another one that hurts, <laughs> but uh, I'm just, I'm teasing you. So you were a Sonics fan. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So were you a, a basketball fan growing up on the East coast? Uh, no, actually, I became a basketball fan in Seattle. Okay. All yeah. Right. Yeah. I just, uh, some the people I connected with, they got me watching games and then I got into it and I was living on Queen Anne and okay. other friend, and we all chipped in and, right. you know, bought seats and kind of rotated a, among us. Like, you know, I didn't get to go to every game. We, right. we shared it out and. But Queen I Anne, I mean, what a great neighborhood to live in. To if you're a Sonics fan, that's a, I mean, you that's your backyard. That's awesome. All right. So and it couple, was you know Kemp and Big Smooth and Gary Payton and just you're hurting me now. This is becoming a painful episode for me. It's just, just painful. Yes, I'm sure you feel the pain too because oh gosh, yes, yeah. And hopefully, yeah. hopefully they're coming back in the next couple of years. And it sounds like the NBA is going to finally make this that happen. That was is. It was, it was awful what happened what the what the nba allowed to happen in seattle was was tragic you didn't know this was gonna be a sports show did you um but it was tragic and the nba needs to remedy it okay mm -hmm. in, in the story. i, I okay. wholeheartedly agree with you okay so a couple other questions so you moved from new york to seattle so i got to imagine that that's a bit of a jump um i mean new york yeah. i've been to new york once in my life many many years ago a little larger than Seattle, haha. -ha. Um, but you know, this massive center of the world community, the city that 
to Seattle, which is still a big city, but it wasn't mm -hmm. that big compared mm -hmm. to. So did you enjoy going from the big, big city down to a, a big city? Um, well, yeah, yeah, actually. I, I, so moving any place new always is a challenge. And um, my piece of advice for people making leaps like that now is like, you have to give it at least three years. Like it just, it just takes time. You you yeah. just have to get used to it. And, um, uh, and I will say that I, I, you know, st then and now still go back to New York so I can still kind of get my big city fix. Mm -hmm. Um, and what, um, I, I love, I love, well, well, I love public transportation systems. And so that was one of the hardest things about coming to Seattle because that certainly then the public transportation didn't work and it still doesn't. Um, but that's another show entirely. It's another, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it was a bit of a challenge, but, um, but at the same time, I was, I was totally into it. Um, it's a Seattle is a is a beautiful city, um, and I just reveled in you know cresting hills and getting these views of the Olympic Mountains and the Space Needle and um, and and it's very neighborhood. You know you have Capitol Hill and Ballard and Queen Anne and um, and each place has its own personality, which. New York has two, you know, New York has different neighborhoods and they all have their own personalities. And so I kind of took comfort in that. And then um, I say the other thing that I just I really enjoyed, uh, especially those first few years, was the food. I loved the food in Seattle. And, and that goes to just day to day quality of life issues. Um, I loved going to the Pike Place Market and doing literally my grocery shopping there. And I always wanted there to be like a special place where locals could park. Um, <laughs> there, there was actually for a number of years, there was one parking lot where if you were in and out in under 30 minutes, it was free. And again, I'm from New York, so I can move really fast when I need to. And I had it down like I could park do my grocery shopping for the week and get out of there in under 30 minutes. So it could be done. I don't think they have that anymore. That's now. another episode in itself too. This, <laughs> this 30 minutes shopping strategies at the market. Okay. But so, the food and the, the seafood and salmon. And I just, I really, really enjoyed that. And so I would say those were kind of my, my, the two things that, helped me to ease into the Pacific Northwest and, and make that, that switch. Okay. But then you walked away from it all and moved to Whidbey yeah. where it's more bicycle car dependent. You're not, you know, you, you don't have neighborhoods like. Yeah. You do. I mean, the towns are kind of, to me, the towns yeah. are their own neighborhood, but, but still they're, you, you're not walking. Oh, maybe you are. But I actually I am. I live in one of those towns on Whidbey and I I can walk places. Okay. Yeah. Can you still shop in 30 minutes? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I can. All right. Well, okay. We'll get to that. So, when you moved from Seattle to Whidbey, once again, you you downshifted size a yeah. great great deal. Did you en did you, well, obviously you enjoyed it cuz you're still there. I get the feeling if you weren't enjoying your experience, you wouldn't we wouldn't be talking today with you sitting on Whidbey Island. Mm. But what about Whidbey has been a surprise for you? You moved there. You were obviously, you know, you went during the summer, you went during winter, and you still moved there, but what what sort of unexpected surprises have you have you encountered on the island? Well, that's a that's a good question. Um what unexpected surprises? Okay. Um, I, so even with kind of moving around and, and I should say, like, I, I think why this works is because even though I'm, I'm from a big place over the years in different situations, I have thrived in smaller environments. 
I went to a very small high school in oh, in New York City. That's right. You did. We talked about that. Yeah. I When I went to college, I chose a really um, unpopular uh, major and wound up in a very, very small department where like by my junior year, most of my classes were in professor's offices because they wouldn't wow. give us a classroom because there were so few of us. Um, okay. uh, I lived for a couple of years in Woodstock, New York. Mm -hmm. Peace out. Yeah. Yep. So, it was a so small little concert there a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, and, and with those experiences, I learned that even though I'm from a big city and I love big cities mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day level, I, I thrive in a smaller environment. I want to pause you because I want to, I want to go back to the phone conversation we had because I, I just alluded to it and the audience doesn't have a clue, but there's okay. something about your high school experience. I, I thought was to me fascinating. So I'm going to recall what I remember of it. And there's a couple of details I need you to plug in. So when we were talking, you told me you, when to get to high school, you took the subway, right? Uh, yeah. I took a bus and then a subway. So when, yeah. when I think of somebody, when we think of New York city, we think everything's, you know, on the subway, but it's close, but you know, it's not, how long was your commute to high school? It was about two hours one way. Yeah. Now that happens in Seattle. If you're going from Queen Anne to Ballard, just because of traffic, but you, you took a bus and the subway yeah. to go to high school. Yeah. That's crazy to me. That just, that just, when you shared that with me on the phone, I was like, I couldn't, I still couldn't like connect the dots in my brain. Oh, there are kids doing that. Totally. There, there are kids wow. doing that in New York city. They're doing that in other cities. There's actually, so, so here on, on the, I'm just, my point is that there are interesting commutes going on all over the place. Um, <laughs> so we, so to, to diverge just for a moment. So um, I own and manage a small business called Woodby Island Kayaking and we do tours and rentals and instruction and repairs and stuff like that. But one of the programs that we do, we do um, a water safety and kind of marine biology course for a local alternative high school. So it's a very small, small school, high school age kids. Um, we'll do like a couple of weeks with them in the spring semester and a couple of weeks with them in the fall. And they got a new student this, this spring who is coming over from the mainland. So this young, the young person wakes up, you know, fairly early in the morning and somehow gets to the ferry and then takes the ferry over to Whidbey Island just to go to this alternative high school. And I was talking with them like, Oh, how is that? And how's that going for you? And, you know, I, again, I didn't blink. Cause I'm like, yeah, okay. No big deal. But are you enjoying it? She's like, yeah, I, you know, it's time that I get to like process and be alone and be in my head and just kind of make the transition from home to school. And I was like, yeah, I get it. That's cool. That's totally, very cool. Totally get it. But okay. So I might be able to blow your mind just a little bit more. So I did that for high school. Um, later on in my working career, I was hoping to get a job and, but it wasn't available yet. But at the same time, my boyfriend at the time and I were moving to Woodstock, Vermont, I'm sorry, Woodstock, New York mm -hmm. from New York city. And so for a time I had to commute from Woodstock, New York to the city for my job. That was a three to three and a half hour commute each way. And I did that. I signed up for it because I thought that this transition would be like a month, mm -hmm. maybe six weeks. It wound up being seven months. So for seven months I did, I commuted literally six hours a day. So that that's impressive. And that's. It's kind of crazy. I'm, I'm questioning your judgment, but yeah. As an adult with a job, it's not as impressive as a high school kid. Yeah. A high school, a teenager going, the story you just shared about the, 
the, the kid that's going to the alternative school now, they're getting on the ferry. The fact that their attitude about it is amazing. But most teenagers aren't as disciplined as most employees, workers are, right? Because if you didn't show up to work, that paycheck might not be quite what you're hoping for. And your landlord probably goes, well, I still want all the rent. So we force ourselves into being more disciplined as we grow up. I, I really wanted the job. So, yeah. but so, I was also 24 years old. I wasn't that old. You weren't that old. Oh, you're still a kid. Okay. So prior to all this though, you were working at McMillan and before we hit record, we were talking about some experiences you had there, which was really, really cool, which again, could be a whole nother, not related to Washington, but really very cool. Uh, is that what brought you out to Seattle? Was the job with McMillan? Yes, okay. yes it was. It okay, was. so were you working for McMillan when you moved to Whidbey? I was, yes. Okay, so, yeah. but you're not working for them anymore. Nope. So we, we shifted again from corporate. Yes. You know, McMillan's a book publisher in case somebody yeah. out there didn't catch that. And books are these things that have, they're on your Kindle. Sorry, just kidding. Um, so you went from book publishing. Yeah. Did you go straight from Macmillan to where you are? Or did was there a, a, was there a more? Okay, so you did. All right. So how long were you on the island before you transitioned from corporate to small business? Uh, I was on the island for six years. Okay, so a, a, a good amount of time, a good amount of time. I'm kidding you when I say it like this, but why on earth did you buy a kayak business on Whidbey Island? I know, I know. Um, what were you thinking? What was I What did thinking? mom say? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, mom wasn't super excited about that. Um, but um, so again, threads through one's life. So back to when I was an undergrad and before I started working at Macmillan, um, I was working at a, a small independent bookstore that sold only mysteries, by the oh, way. That's very cool. Relating to another conversation. Right, that we, right. It's called Haven't Got a Clue. Such a great <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. So, but what I got from that experience was that I wanted to own my own business. I really was not interested in working for other people. And therapy I, I didn't, wanted my own thing. And therapy didn't help you? I'm kidding. I I, I am a, I'm a huge proponent of... The short, condensed... I looked at these sales reps who would come to the bookstore and you know tell us about the new books and take orders and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, so you get to create your own schedule. You're responsible for your own expenses you have to maintain your own customer base. Like you work for somebody, but you're kind of running your own deal. Oh, so that looks like running your own business with kind of a safety net under you. Mm -hmm. I want to do that because that's going to train me to get to where I want to go. So that's how I came to go into book publishing. That's why I started working for Macmillan. I started being a sales rep in the Northeast. I wound up take, becoming a sales rep for them in the Northwest. That's how I got here. Okay. Then along the way, um, I did go back to school and I got my MBA and I focused on um, triple bottom line entrepreneurship. Okay. And then like inertia st st sets in, right? Um, cause you have, you have money coming in, you have, you know, a company car, you have this job and it's hard, it's hard making that transition. And so over the years, like I wrote business plans, I looked at everything from franchises to buying other businesses. I moved to Whidbey, uh, with somebody here, I started a business we closed it six months later. Like there was a lot of fits and starts, right? Mm -hmm. But that was always, that was my goal. That was my okay. goal. And I was familiar with this company, the Whidbey Island Kayaking was an existing company. And just one day I saw on Facebook that it was for sale. And I literally turned to my partner and you can delete stuff here, right? We're not going to. Okay. Unless well, you I, tell me to, and then for I a small fee. I turned to them and I was like, fuck it, I'm buying it. 
we and won't that's that. where we're going. And that's how this is. So happen. I got it. Okay. Got, I got more questions. I, I love it. I love this, but I got to ask you, were you a customer of the kayaking business? I had been, yeah, I had okay. been out a couple once or twice, like when I had family visiting. So I wasn't like deep customer, but I knew of them. Uh huh. Um, I, but I also had ideas as a somebody who had moved to Woodby. I also had ideas about uh, possibly serving the visitors in a mm -hmm. better way. Mm -hmm. Um. Again, and that was one of those business plans that got started but never got finished. And so I figured that buying the kayaking company would be a launching off point and I could further develop it from there. Okay. Um, I'll also, I should say that I've always, again, going back to my youth and through my life, I've always been a swimmer, mm -hmm. not like Olympic, but I've always been a swimmer. I've been a lifeguard. Um, I've done Red Cross water safety instruction. Um, I've, I'm an open water swimmer, or at least at the time I was an open water swimmer. I've coached triathletes. I've swam, I've swam in places around the world. And so I come to this with a very healthy respect and passion for the water. Almost. Yeah. For the water and almost like a, a complimentary set of skills not so that's interesting to me that you were a cat i'll call you a casual customer of the business okay it wasn't the whole what was the what's the name you know i like the company so much i bought it you know the the yeah. remington yeah whatever it wasn't you weren't an avid kayaker so you bought an established business that's there's a i mean <sighs> We're not going to turn this into, I mean, we already went away from sports. We're not going to turn this into a business podcast today, but you know, small businesses are super easy. There's payroll is always easy to pay. Taxes are easy. Nothing about small business is hard. You, no, it's so, yeah, yeah really. super easy. I don't know why you went and got an MBA. I just, okay. Anyway, <laughs> super easy. State of Washington is just the most pleasant organization to work with. Everything about small, everyone, if you haven't opened a small business, just cash just in your 401ks and go do it. Trust me. Just don't listen to me. So you bought a small business in a, in a, in a field that has some overlap, but not, you're not an expert. No. You inherited a staff though, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. a couple. Yeah. Okay. Couple. So you inherited, you inherited a couple of people who were yeah. probably more and familiar they, with it. They taught. Yeah. They, they taught. And, and I'm going to guess that the owner, there was probably a transitionary period where they stuck around for a while or did they literally yeah. just go, we cashed the check. Here's the keys. See ya. No, I worked that into the contract. Okay. So you got a little bit but, of mentoring and, yes. and, you know, tutoring and okay. So you now are the proud owner of a, of a, of kayak business on Whidbey Island. And this, I, I'm going somewhere with all of this. Okay. So, cause the, one of the primary reasons that we're talking today is you're involved in the community. Yes. So, we're going to go in that direction now. So when did you start getting involved in the Whidbey Island community? When did I, you know, probably right. Well, I had to make friends. I didn't know anybody when I moved here. I mean, like I literally didn't know anybody when I moved here again. I, it, it, my mom read it in the New York times. We came here like I did zero. I did not know anybody. Um, so yeah, I had to become part of the community because I wanted to make some friends. And so the first community that I made friends with were, was, were the swimmers. Okay. And, and generally I'll just say to all the swimmers around the world, like you're all awesome. Uh, some of the most accepting, um, welcoming people I've met over the years. Um, when, when did you get involved with the South Whidbey parks and recreation? So, um, I started, I helped, I volunteered uh, with a number of events. Um, okay. And yeah, that's kind of where it starts, right? You you volunteer and you help put on something in your community. So I volunteered, you know, with, with the triathlon and various roles and, and other races. Uh, again, I helped put on some open water swim clinics and things like that. So that's really 
it's yeah that okay. was how i connected with people and then um i became a commissioner uh elected commissioner 4 years ago um and was that because you weren't at the meeting and they just said you weren't there were electing her <laughs> is that <laughs> How does uh, that was yeah, I, yeah at the time I was like so you know I have this small business like I don't have a tremendous amount of time and the executive director was like yeah but you have a business here so like you should be able to make meetings because you're on the island it's not like you're commuting over to Seattle to go to work so I'm like <laughs> okay fair enough yeah they got um, you on that one yeah totally got me on that one so in any case, and I, I I firmly believe that like everybody has a responsibility to participate where where they are and try to make where they live a better place in whatever capacity that they have. Mm -hmm. And everybody has different strengths and capacities and interests and and that's wonderful. And they should they should contribute um, yeah. because democracy involves participation, period. Okay. Um, so this, this was my way of participating and, you know, and doing my time. Unfortunately, I was sworn in right <laughs> at the end of 2019. And oh. one of the first things we did was, you know, close down the parks in 2020. So, um, the beginning of my, my period was, was difficult. Um, and now it's crazy busy. Cause like every, you know, Right. Thank you coming back and coming out, but yeah. So we were connected. I, I once again, I think you were volun voluntold to, yes. to, <laughs> to talk to me, but we were talking about, you know, regenerative transfer tourism or tra what was the word you used earlier? Uh, um, Transformational tourism. So let's, let's unpack that. Okay. Cause I'm a tourist. I hop on the ferry. I come over, I drive around the Island. I leave. That's not well, and in many cases, we've seen places where <laughs> Woodstock wasn't left in the most. <laughs> Why are you involved in this, and what is the goal that you and the organizations are trying to bring about? Okay, so. Um, the goal, the big overarching goal is to make tourism a force for good, to turn tourism, and I'm using, you know, big mm -hmm. meaning anywhere, right. the industry, to make it to where it is not an extractive industry, mm -hmm. but is a regenerative and replenishing industry. Now, one... One, I'm not because I'm going to use the word argue, and I don't mean that's not the, I'm not arguing with you, but one yeah. would say that, well, my consumer dollars are replenishing these businesses. Yeah, money ain't enough. Yeah, that just doesn't cut so, it. So, anymore. how does one, how are you, how are, what are you doing, and how are you going about it to? Money ain't enough is probably not the caption we want to use. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to win me. Money ain't enough. No, right. um, but, but how and are I we? Just I, for a movie. I mean, I know you. I know worldwide. I'm, I know, and I'm kind of teasing you. But how does one go about helping tourists understand that they have a an active role to play, and they mm -hmm. should want to play an active role? Yeah. In this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so for us on Whidbey, so again, coming mm -hmm. in a little smaller is. We're, we are starting on this, this uh, campaign's not the right word, but changing how tourism is handled here on Whidbey so that our community benefits the whole community from the people to the plants, to the wildlife. Mm -hmm. Okay. But also with that, we want our guests to have better experiences mm -hmm. so so like what you said like you come to Whidbey you drive on you know you do some stuff and you leave and then you go home and like you don't think about it again like like that that doesn't really work for you 
honestly. It's not. You just a, spent all that money and like yeah. you're not really coming away with anything. So it's also about creating a better experience for the guest. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, I'm going to go really big picture again. Maybe if that guest learned something, sees a different way of doing it, benefits in some way, they take that idea, that learning, that mindset change home with them, mm -hmm. and they then apply it to improving their own community because we're back to we all need to participate in our democracy, right? We need, we need a flywheel effect. We need, right. We need, exactly. We need exactly. So, so that's really what it's about. How is that in your opinion? Now, you know, mm -hmm. delicate question here, but you know, in your opinion, is this working well on would be? We're just starting. I know, but is it, is, is oh, it being received? Starting. Is it being received well within the community yeah. and within the tourism's, the, the tourists that are coming to the community are they is it being well received so i would say so far yes so okay. uh, we're we're just starting like sure. we're just having our first community meetings about getting getting others in the community involved and in how to do this um but okay i i own a small business so i can use it as an incubator for whatever i want Mm -hmm. So, of course, I have. Mm -hmm. And so we've started doing some uh, different tours. So still, you know, catering to the tours, to the visitor. But we started doing these different tours, which we call point to points. People meet us at our headquarters. They park their cars there. We we have a van and bring them to a specific launch spot, which we choose. Mm -hmm. The, and then they paddle a one-way route, so they're seeing different stuff, different things, different vistas the whole way, and then we shuttle them back to our location, and, and then they take off. And the, the cool things about this is, first of all, they're not driving individual cars to that launch point. Right. We're, we're bringing them down, so we're having a smaller footprint mm -hmm. at our public areas thereby leaving more room for locals to park so that what happens in the summer is we get so many visitors that locals can't get to the water or to the trails or wherever. So if we can reduce the footprint of the guests, mm -hmm. guests can use that space and locals can use that space both. Which And then also we... Guests can choose, you know, do they want a morning tour or an afternoon tour on a specific day, but we pick the route. Mm -hmm. You can't be like, I want to go here or go here. First of all, you don't know the area. Mm -hmm. you, 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 don't, you don't really have enough information to pick. Plus, I, I know we're all so accustomed to saying, I want this at this time in this way, and I'm going to click this Amazon buy button, and it's going to be dropped on my head by a drone in three seconds. Like here, we have tides, we have currents, and we have wind. And so some locations are not good paddles on certain days. So we pick the best possible route given the conditions of those days, as well as we absolutely take into account what the guests are looking for, what kind of experience, like is it a family or, you know, what's their experience level to put this together so that they have the best possible time. You're curating the experience. In an, in an even further way, but yeah. it also involves trust. Right. We're saying to them, like, Trust us, right. not just give us your money and pay for this service, but trust us to work with you mm -hmm. so that we can get you out there to show you really amazing stuff and teach you about this. And maybe also you'll realize like there's a bigger world here. There are, there's wind and there's current and there's tide that you have no control over. 
That's true. Which is really hard for people. Oh my gosh, I don't have control over everything. No, you don't. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Connect with it. Be with it. Appreciate it. Because it's really cool how this all works. A word that you've used multiple times now is the word guest. Yes. Is that a conscious shift by you and others to consider tourists, outsiders, city people, whatever, whatever we'll treat, we're going to consider them guests. They are a welcome. We appreciate them. And we are here to serve them to a point and they, they have to be respectful. It's not, this is not exactly. So it's, it's, it's a two way street, but we're going to, we're going to start by considering you a guest and how you act in my home is whether you'll be, you'll be asked back again, you know, a guest in my home. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And also the guest, the tourist needs to understand they are a guest in someone's home. Right. Yeah. Whidbey Island, Washington but state, you whatever put community the toilet seat back down, you wipe your feet or you take your shoes off. Mm-hmm. If that's what the custom is. Right. That's yeah, be, right. Being a little bit more aware of your surroundings versus self-absorbed. Yeah. Okay. No, I love this. This all rings very, very authentic and very true to me. This you're early on in this. What's, So when we're recording this and when this is going to go out, it's July of 2023. So early, early phases of this project. So let's talk about the summer of 23. It's July. It's after the 4th of July. So summer has started. I mean, that's kind of the running joke. So what's on the horizon for this summer? What are you, what's your, what are you guys trying to do for this summer? Um, So in terms of the, the community, Mm -hmm. um, we, so there's been a steering committee okay. of numerous people in the community from heads of chambers of commerce to other experienced providers like myself to um, people who are involved in some of the nonprofits here. Um, we have a ton of nonprofits on would be um, you kind of say like you, you can't swing a cat without hitting a nonprofit or, or a yoga instructor, but generally the nonprofit will come first. So and no, no, no cats were harmed in this experiment. I'm just, just <laughs> no, but, putting that out there. Okay. So, um, but that that's great, right? There, there's a lot of, uh, what that means is there are a lot of people who are passionate about a lot of different things and they are willing to organize to try to get things done. Okay. So that's an absolute strength of this community. So, so we've, we've been working as this steering committee to, try to create um, some ideas that as a whole community we can get around. So we came up with four pillars. Okay. Um, the first one is healthy nature. Having healthy nature is something that bonds all of us here. Um, bridge building. So making connections between between organizations, between communities, like I spoke about how Oak Harbor is very different from, let's say, Coopville or Langley, other towns, but but we still have things in common and, and things that we can come together. So making those connections between the communities. Also, our community is two islands. It's actually Whidbey and Camino Island. Um, so bridging those two places. Um, another pillar is access. So we live in Washington state, Um, something like over 80% of our shoreline here is privately owned. Mm -hmm. Washington state, like in Oregon and California, like those beaches, they're all public. That is not the case here. Um, And so just in that example, like how do we get more access to to natural resources? How do we get more access to trails? How do we get more access to services? And that access, it's about for our community. 
Uh, I'll give you another example. So again, we get crazy, crazy busy. Um, there's here, just like every place else, the cost of housing is astronomical. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of people here who are working, who are working in the service industry and other jobs who are working three and four jobs just to be able to live here, they don't have the time to go to the beach. So that's part of it too. How do we, how do we change the economics okay. of the place so that everybody has access to the resources that they need? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the fourth pillar is just transformational mindset which is that just goes to say that this is going to be a constantly changing process and we need to commit to being open to new ideas and constantly checking in, maybe creating new things and keeping that going. This, this is not, it's not a one year marketing campaign. No. This no. is a hundred year vision. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's what the steering committee has done, has been working on for the last year. Now we're starting to get this out to the community. We've had some online meetings uh, coming up this month. We have some in-person meetings mm -hmm. in terms of, again, bridge building, trying to make those connections so that we can come up with um, some different, some different programs and, and try. We're at the point where we're trying. We're going to be in beta mode for a while. But see, that's, that's okay. Yeah. It's okay. If you don't try, it won't change will not happen. Exactly. So you have to try. Yeah. And, and this is coming about because, well, yeah. So COVID-19 pandemic, it was a bit of a, that changed mm -hmm. a lot of things, right? So um, a lot of people didn't go anywhere and everything came to a stop for a short amount of time. And then people continued to come to Whidbey. Um, and, but it gave us a chance to say, you know what, going forward, we don't want to go back. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go back to before COVID. And again, this more extractive tourist model. Right. We want to go, we want to learn from what we've seen and do a reset. And we know it's going to take time, but it's worth it. I'm on the Whidbey Camino islands.com website right now. And I'm mm -hmm. on the, what is regenerative tourism? There's a right. blurb there. And this yeah. one, this one, there's, there's four bullet points here, but this one, this one, um, this one really resonates to me and that's not anti-growth. It simply asks us that we grow the things that matter most to us in ways that benefit the entire system and never at the expense of others. Exactly. Yeah. You can boil that down into two words. I'm oversimplifying it, but win-win. Very simple concept. Very simple concept. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to... I'm going to ask you to play tour guide for me. I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios and I want you to put on your, I'm going to be a guest for the sake of this conversation. Okay. I'm coming to Whidbey Island. Mm -hmm. I've got a day. Okay. okay. What time does the first ferry get on Whidbey typically? Uh, I think Ish. it's like six, Ish. six 30. I'm probably not on the first. I actually, I probably would be on the first ferry. Let's go with that. I'm going to, I'm going to take the first ferry over to Whidbey. That that's a good choice because the lines get long later. Right, on the so day. I'm gonna take I'm gonna be on the first ferry. It would be. Mm -hmm. I love coffee. Okay. Where can I get now? First off, I'm not coming back to Whidbey if I can't get good coffee. I mean, it's that's and I know I can get coffee on Whidbey, but where can I go to get great coffee on Whidbey Island? Okay, great coffee. Um, We're setting the bar pretty high. Great coffee. Yeah, yeah, great coffee. So this is gonna. All right, I have a, I have a couple of recommendations. Right. So, um, you know, we have a number of places that do like really good, like bougie coffee. You know, your your <sighs> latte steamed, like medium hot, triple shot. Yeah, mm -hmm. 
totally. Okay. Um, we have a number of those. Um, but I'm, but I'm, let me, let me. I'm a get, drip. I'm a drip gal. I, I'm so, drip or pour over. I'm a simple, my, I, I like yeah. my coffee simple. Yeah, me too. Grounds in water. Yeah. Okay. Totally. Yeah. So. so so honestly, like, uh, I know I have to get stuff done. I need a cup of coffee. I'm going to the commons, the okay. commons, it's a nonprofit. Okay. It's in Langley, which is the town where I live. Okay. Um, their, their mission is to, uh, basically teach young people, um, skills, marketable skills that they can then use to get jobs elsewhere. Um, they do, I mean, they do really nice, you know, steamed coffee and all that too, but they have great drip. Mm -hmm. The beans that they use are Muckle Teo coffee, Muckle Teo coffee, even though it's called Muckle Teo coffee roasters, it's actually roasted here on Whidbey. That's a local business for us. A number of places carry Muckle Teo coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, you see that sign, you're going to get a good cup of coffee. All right. So. I'm in Langley. I've had my coffee. I'm ready to go. Where should I go? I got a day. Let's, let's map out a good day for me. One of the space I'm going to ask you to map out. If you look at me, I'm a small petite human being. Ha. I've, I've been in a kayak once in my life. I want to go on a kayak tour. Yeah. What would you suggest for a absolute novice? Um, so I would say one of our loop tours okay. there, um, they are only two hours, so it's a, it's a good bite. Um, you're, you're out there doing it, but it's not going to strain you or kill the rest of your day. Um, <laughs> we no. do that out of Langley on certain days and out of Coopville other days. So mm -hmm. different locations so um yeah either that or honestly one of those point to point tours mm -hmm. um even though it's a little longer that is still definitely for a beginner okay. and you still would be done in time for lunch it's like so, you know it's like, like you know me well your okay. morning right and okay. then you can get lunch and then continue especially on these long summer days and right. then I think at that point like if you're starting here on the south end then i think we would be sending you up the island okay so where am i going to grab lunch then so sandwiches yeah, you can't go wrong with the sandwich. Take a sandwich because then you're going to want to go to like a beach or a bluff or a trail right mm -hmm. your sandwich um I have two suggestions. In Clinton, there's Pickles Deli. Um, Pickles Deli. Okay. They make their, that's like, you know, Boar's Head. They have really good pickles. They do fantastic sandwiches. Um, but if you're headed north at that point, um, like right there with it, the Green Bank Pantry. Okay. I walk into the Green Bank Pantry and it smells like the East Coast because they've got the prosciutto and the salamis and the provolone. And I just, it smells like New York. And they make their own semolina bread and they have amazing sandwiches. All right. All but right. you, so either place, either, I'm not yeah, going to go either, wrong either place. All right. Not, you will not go wrong at either place. And, and I'm going to put you on the spot. Put you on the spot. And, okay. What sandwich should I order? So this is where I'm proud. Well, okay. Um, at Pickles, I would go with, all right, I should say back when I was eating meat, I no longer do, but I would go with the Smoky Beast. Smoky Beast, okay. Smoky Beast, which I would also usually sub turkey for the roast beef. So it depends. If you like the roast beef, go with the classic. Mm -hmm. But you could sub in turkey instead, and that's still really, really good. Right. They also do a killer banh mi. So uh -huh. those are two meat recommendations. All right. Um, they also do a wonderful, like, if you're more pescatarian, a smoked salmon kind of wrap thing. And yeah, Pickles has a lot of good choices. <laughs> Green Bank Deli, um, they do a version of a muffaletta. I also, a part of me loves New Orleans. So they do a version of a muffaletta that is terrific. Um, one of their seasonal, the what I usually get, and it's only seasonal, 
but it's called the samurai. And believe it or not, it's tofu. It's a tofu sandwich. It is delicious. So why seasonal? I mean, do you know why they? I don't know why they do that just seasonally. I mean, is it? So in the winter, I have to switch to the grilled ve- veggie sandwich, okay. which is also still that, really, really good. That sounds solid too. That sounds it's solid. It's totally solid. But okay. the samurai, for some reason, it's a summer thing. Okay. Yeah. And they do like black sesame seeds on it. And yeah, it's really good. Okay. So if I had lunch, where where should I, as I'm working my way north, yeah. what do you got for me? So um, we have a fairly n- somewhat new place, a couple of years. Um, it's called the Price Sculpture Forest. Okay. Now I'm sending you north. So yep. now we're going to send you over to Coopville, the Price Sculpture Forest. Um okay. It has uh, two different loops in it. One that's like definitely kind of very accessible for all ages. And then a little longer loop that has a little bit more up and down, but still very, very doable. It is a forest of sculptures. That's, for real. That sounds cool. And here, and there are descriptions of the sculptures. Like they have QR codes so you can read or hear about the artist or what have you. Um, so insider tip, not everything is going to be right on the trail. You need to look back into the woods. You need to look up. You need to look down. You need to look out. Okay. Love it. Okay. Love this place. And right. that is, that is by donation only. So donate what you can. Okay. Yep. Very cool. I've never heard of that place. That's, yeah. um, that's, that's never heard of, and which is considering what we do, not necessarily a good thing for me to be able to say. Sure it's heard, but. really powerful, I think, because you you are in a forest, although you get some views of mm-hmm. Penn Cove as well. Um, well, Penn Cove, Saratoga Passage. Um, and you, you still have, you have your ferns and the... Douglas firs and the alders, but you, you, you're also, you're getting some culture. You're getting okay. some art on. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I'm done there. I need coffee again. Coffee. See, I, I can't go. Yeah, I mean, the fact okay, that I've so gone this far without coffee so, again is. So, okay. Now you're in Coopville. So in Coopville, sunshine drip, that's where you want to go for coffee. Although Generally, if you work for Whidbey Island Kayaking and you're picking up boats in Coopville, you're probably going to stop there and get a smoothie instead. Um, The peanut butter chocolate smoothie is totally the way to go. Um, But in Coopville, the other thing is there's K-Paws. There's K-Paws is cream. Okay, let me spell that. That's K-E-P-A-W apostrophe S is cream. I S K R E M E. Homemade ice cream. Hmm. Well, the beautiful thing about this, I don't have to choose between coffee, smoothie, or ice cream. I can do this all or whatever strikes me in the moment. So this, really this is okay. Yeah. So this is good. So I've, I've, so I've also the other food thing is so now you're at your Coopville, you're at Penn Cove. And the thing <laughs> about Penn Cove is that's where Penn Cove mussels come from. Mm-hmm. That is, just talk about sustainable, regenerative, win-win food right there, those mussels. Um, That was the first aquaculture business actually in the United States. I think it's 1970, 70, 71, if I remember correctly. Um, What's amazing about them, you know, again, because this is not a business podcast, but what I really admire is that they they only harvest what they have orders for. So it's not like they're going to harvest whatever and like ship it out and try to sell it. It's like, this is fresh and this is going for you. We we need this number of pounds and that's what we're harvesting. And if they pull it out of the water that morning, it is served in Seattle for lunch that day. And it will be on somebody's dinner plate in New York City that night. Yeah, that's crazy. That's super fresh. Yeah. And yeah. they're delicious. They're, they're, I love them. They're wonderful. Yeah. All right. So I've refueled, seen some in sculpture. Mm-hmm. Let's call this my final leg of the journey. Where should I go between there 
what should I stop? What should I go look at? What else is up there? I mean, I know there's a lot, so I'm, and I'm just asking, you know, I'm putting you on the spot. There's no. for everything that you're sharing. There's a dozen other options. That oh, are, God. There's, yeah. so much. So, there's so much to do here, but okay. I'm going to take this back to the, to the water. Cause okay. that's yeah. let's do it. I love. So I would head to um, Joseph Woodby state park. Joseph would be super. Um, okay. Yeah. It's not, it's not very big. Um, I would head there. And, and when you're there, you're now, you're on the West coast of the Island, not quite the northernmost part, but, but you're really, as you stand there, you are staring down the barrel of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, mm-hmm. which is such an important and powerful waterway that's that's where all our weather comes in and wind so hold on to your hat it could be windy as you're standing there um but also that that's what connects us to the pacific mm-hmm. that all all the the cruise ships that are coming in from alaska to all of the the carrier ships and all the containers from china that's where they're coming. They're coming in the Strait of Juan de Fuca and down the west side of Woodby Island to head into the ports of Seattle and Tacoma. And that that connection to the ocean and to the Pacific. And, and again, back to that, there is so much that is larger than us. Mm-hmm. We all get so caught in the minutia of our lives and the immediacy of our phones and buy buttons in the now that I feel like just you don't need a ton of time but just taking like 15 20 minutes and standing at that spot and looking down that immense body of water just puts that all into perspective okay I agree dinner on the island dinner on the island oh gosh so now you're up in Oak Harbor Gosh, um, there's a lot up in Oak Harbor. There's good barbecue at Orlando's. You have, um, if you have not had enough fried fish at this point, there's sea bolts. Um, there's actually, there's a, I've been hearing on social media. I haven't been there, but there's a new Indian restaurant that I'm dying to try. Um, so yeah, there's a lot up there. Okay. In your opinion, what is the single most overlooked cool fact about Whidbey Island? And if you could see the look she just made, folks. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a poker face. No. Um, no. <laughs> she just folded. <laughs> Single most overlooked fact about Whidbey Island. Hmm. I know that's a maybe an impossible question. Yeah, I. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Kind of stumped me. Okay. Overlooked fact. Yeah. I, my mind is like, okay, is it like, am I going science or like ge- geography or what about the people? What about the people? Um, Cause it, it, that's what it comes down to, right? It's about, mm-hmm. the, about the people here. Well describe. Okay. I'm going to ask, I'm going to re- give you another question. You, you've narrowed it down. I'm, now I'm going to ask you the a follow-up question in one word, describe the people of Whidbey Island. Oh gosh. <laughs> um engaged okay i like that word all right two last questions for you all right what didn't i ask you that i should have you actually you asked it you actually got it yeah okay yeah all right so you're ready for this is the last question this okay. might be the hardest question i'm going to ask you the whole time and there is no way out of this question you have to answer it okay, okay. cake or pie and why Ice cream cake. Why? Because it's cake and ice cream at the same time. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
I'll, I'll allow Although, it. <laughs> I'll say like on Whidbey, probably everybody else would say pie and we have great pie here. But for me personally, ice cream cake. All right. Or cake with ice cream, but some combination of that. Cake and ice cream. Okay. All right. Well, if it's going to be cake and ice cream, what type of cake? Chocolate cake. Chocolate cake? Totally. Any, yeah. any defining it a little bit more like German chocolate or a, a, a some, mocha, you know? It'd be kind of, kind of, be kind of, kind of rich. Um, no, just like a really good straight chocolate ice cream, a chocolate cake, not too sweet because you're going to be putting the ice cream with it. Mm -hmm. So just like chocolate, it doesn't even need the icing, just the cake. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are no wrong answers here. Yeah, no, no. But it's funny to watch people's faces when I ask that question. Right. And the ice cream, I mean, that's flexible. Like on a hot day, mint chocolate chip would be really nice with that. Okay. But at any other time, I mean, vanilla, chocolate okay. vanilla is always really good. But it, then fruit seeds, like strawberry ice cream and chocolate cake, that's good too. Yeah, that's, that's, I like that combo. Now, that's, that's, that's not a combo you get often because I don't I, think of those two together, but that's a great combo. Yeah. That's a yeah. great combo. Yep. Well, since I dropped my pen, I guess we're done. Um, Krista, thank you so much for being on here. This is this is a lot of fun for me. I think would be's. I like the direction that this is going. I I think it needs to happen elsewhere. Also, not just on Whidbey Island. I think you know, but you really have to start where you live, and you're part of that. So I, I applaud you and the steering committee and everybody that's involved for this. I think it's, it's probably overdue. Not, not that you, not, that I'm not, it's overdue. Just, yeah. And uh, again, thank you for being on. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Scott. I had a good time. Hope you enjoyed the show. You can reach me on Twitter at explore law state. I'd love to hear your comments. You can also visit our website at explorewashingtonstate.com. If you know anyone who would like the show, it'd be amazing if you'd share the show with them. This is the biggest way that we grow this show. Good old word of mouth. Glad you were here with me today, and I hope to have you listening to the next episode. See you then.